Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. Please let me know if you have any trouble hearing or seeing. So I'm going to start the next session, which is a case study in autoimmune hepatitis. These are my disclosures, which are not related to the talk. So we have a 65-year-old woman with new fatigue and arthralgias for four weeks. She denies infectious exposures, travel, new medications, any alcohol use. Her past medical history is notable for only hypothyroidism. She does have a family history of autoimmune disease, which includes celiac disease, but not herself. And on physical exam, she does not have any signs of chronic liver disease. So Dr. Saab or Dr. Han or Jihan, any initial thoughts as this woman comes into your office? I'll, I'll be honest, Gina. I mean, uh, this could be anything, uh -huh. um, anything. Uh, I, I, the, the, and these are the Gina. You know, these are the hardest cases with differentials so broad, uh, at least initially. And, and people come and they want a, a quick answer, but it's so difficult. I, I don't know how Jihan feels or Steve C feel. Yeah, it's still wide open. I think. Correct. Okay. So this is not too much of a mystery, but <laughs> get labs. Okay. Labs. And, <laughs> and this is definitely. Hepatocellular, ALT is up to 780, AST is 650, alkaline phosphatase is 120, and the total bilirubin is 1.2, which technically by most lab standards is normal, but certainly we're used to more seeing 0 0.5, 0 0.8 in a normal patient. Encouragingly, her albumin is four and her INR is 1.1. Her platelets are notably 250. Hemoglobin is 12, white count is five. You do check viral hepatitis serologies because you want to be, um, you want to dot all your I's and cross all your T's. And because of her age and her comorbidities, you do check autoimmune markers, which include an ANA, a smooth muscle antibody, and the IgG. Um, a lot of people will check the ANA and the SMA, but the IgG is the one test that everyone always forgets. So it's very good to check an IgG serum because it's very helpful to the patient when they come to us. An ultrasound is performed and it just showed a heterogeneous liver parenchyma, but normal spleen size. So I guess the next question here is, first question is read my mind. What can you <laughs> glean from this set, of, this set of data? Jihan, do you have any? any? Sure, so um, as was pointed out, it could be anything, but I think a woman with a previous history of autoimmune disease with hypothyroidism, family history of celiac disease, hepatocellular pattern, uh, an abnormal liver test. With these serologies, you would be concerned for autoimmune hepatitis. Um, I think it's also important to consider medication-induced autoimmune hepatitis. She didn't give us a history necessarily of uh, supplements or medications, but my experience has been you have to ask that question many different ways, many different times. Um, so I wouldn't completely rule it out, um, but it is reassuring that her. you pointed out that her bilirubin is not completely normal, but I think her synthetic liver function tests are reassuring uh, at this stage. But she may, I think to completely confirm the diagnosis, she may still need a biopsy. Right, so she read my mind twice. So everything Dr. Benamou said, my, my next question was gonna be, what would you do next? And the answer is liver biopsy. And I think what really ticks you off here is of course the positive immune serologies. Even if, even if one of them is positive and the other one is negative, um, I would definitely still biopsy. I think the IgG is really helpful because you only need 1.2 times the upper limit of normal. So an IgG of 2,500 is very, very significant. And you'd be very hard pressed not to have biopsy in that setting. And Jihan made a great point about supplements and herbals. You know, our number one reason for consultation in liver clinic is abnormal liver tests. And the very oftentimes, the number one reason is supplements and herbals that people are taking or new, or new medications like antibiotics being the most common one, not a statin. So to follow Jihan's excellent recommendation, we do do a liver biopsy, uh, preferably a percutaneous one because you just get a bigger piece and more information from that. In the liver biopsy, and you're really contingent on your pathologist here to help you with this diagnosis. It showed active interface hepatitis uh, within the with parenchymal involvement. You see a ton of plasma cells here, uh, lymphocytic infiltrate, and they also talked about stage two or three fibrosis. 
So I think there are a lot of good take-home points from this. Dr. Saab, what do you think about this two to three fibrosis? Does that surprise you with the albumin and the platelets? Yeah, I, have to, I, I was going to ask you, Gino, do you have to do a biopsy at all for these patients? I mean, you you have high liver tests, high artery markers. Should we even do a biopsy? But but the biopsy, this biopsy as, you, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm glad you did it, does show that this is a chronic condition. There's just chronicity. So I, I appreciate Gina's comments regarding medications, but but this with this biopsy, I'm thinking less of daily, less of a medication, more of something chronic like autoimmune. But right. Dr. Cho, Dr. Choi, do you have to do a biopsy on patients you suspect autoimmune? Can't you see them empirically? Oh no! So we always joke that autoimmune hepatitis will keep liver biopsies in business because it's very important diagnostically um, because of the other other heart red herrings that we discussed. Um, and also you're gonna slap someone with a lifelong disease that's gonna require lifelong medication. And I think when you're gonna do that, you really need tissue to make the diagnosis. And all, not only is it diagnostic, it's also prognostic. So this woman had no symptoms. She's in her mid sixties. And clearly there's evidence of liver, long-term liver da damage in the sense of the fibrosis. So she's probably had this maybe intermittent elevated liver test her whole life, maybe up to the 50s, hundreds, no one's ever checked or noticed because it wasn't that high, but clearly there's been inflammatory damage for decades. Okay, and I think one other thing is to just say that, you know, this is just, you know, her being fatigued, which is probably the most common symptom that we see in clinic. You know, this, that's not a very um, specific symptom, you know, so t checking liver tests was the right thing to do. So uh, she was diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis. And just to review that, you know, the diagnosis was based on serologies, the absence of viral hepatitis or other potential commingers, and of course the biopsy and the IgG, which is really kind of like how you make the diagnosis for autoimmune hepatitis. Remember, it wasn't symptoms, right? It was just serologic and histologic findings. So given this diagnosis, you started her initially with prednisone and azathioprine at 50 milligrams per day. In liver, I know in the IBD world, we give one to 1.5 mix per kg of azathioprine, but in the, living room, in the liver world, we sent us to start with azathioprine 50 milligrams. And uh, let me just ask the panel here, you know, what do you think about starting right off the bat with prednisone 20 and azathioprine? Would somebody have just done one, the other, both? I, th I think if she had no fibrosis, I may have done just prednisone. <clears throat> but unfortunately, Gina, I think if she's got fibrosis, uh, as you point out very nicely, this is most like a chronic condition. She's probably needs both medication. But, but I do have a question. Would, would you ever think about checking TPMT levels or any predictors of, of toxicity of azathioprine? Right. So or, or other panelists? Right. So I think the current guidelines do recommend checking TPMT, which is recent compared to what previously was recommended. Um, you know, and 50 milligrams is quite small, but a lot of times we may have to increase the dose for the patient. So I think it is helpful to have the baseline levels. Yeah. I, you know, I, if I start 50 milligrams, I feel pretty confident I usually don't check TPMT levels and the, because you need to check the RBC morphology, that that's how they call it in Care Connect, and also the levels. And if they have high liver tests, then I start worrying about toxicity. Um, but again, you know, in the IBD world, they use 1.5 to 2 mix per kick, which is a lot more. But Jihan's right, though. I find nowadays that I am hiking up the azathioprine up to 150 milligrams per day, especially in men. Dr. Choi, can I, uh, there's a question that chat room might be asking. They're sure. asking about the role of fiber scan for autoimmune. Do you ever That's use great. It? So I think fiber scan is really important, but I think what's important to remember is that, you know, how do you know what's normal, right? So what's the normal range? So the normal range for hep C and alcohol, or actually hep C is the best established, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, even like, for example, BMI, you know, 20 to 24 is normal, 25 to 30 is overweight, 30 to 35, you know what I'm saying? So you have to have the standard thing. So recently we've discovered that for PVC, if your transient, if your fiber scan is over 12, 14, that's considered fibrosis. For hep C, it's a different number. For, uh, hep, for alcohol, it's as high as, I think it's like 30 or something. So you really have to know what your normal range is. And I think for autoimmune hepatitis, 
it's not as well established. But a fiber scan is so minimally invasive, and I think it can give you a lot of information. But if you're going to biopsy them, I think that's still the best. Uh, 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 so, Steve, have you used fiber scans for autoimmunitis? The only time I've used it is um, in people who have advanced fibrosis and been on therapy for many, many years. Uh, and it may give us some confidence about maybe weaning them off. And I think that's part of the new guidelines like Jihan said. But Steve, have you had any experience with fiber scans and autoimmune? Only, only to follow up on therapy, but not for initial diagnosis. Because I think, I think you need the histology to confirm the diagnosis. But then, yeah, I, I have them on azathioprine, maybe five of prednisone, and I, and I do fibro scans or elastography to see if the fibrosis is improving. You know, and I got, I got, I got to say, we're very lucky to have an expert on this panel. Fiber scans, Dr. Pershoyani in Santa Monica. Uh, has one, you know, has one of the few in Santa Monica, so we're very lucky. Uh, Gina, there's a question I think you're going to address later about people who don't respond to prednisone as a thioprint, second line right. therapies. But I think you have that in a later discussion. Yeah, that's half the slide. So thank you so much. For <laughs> me. This is autoimmune, difficult to treat, difficult to diagnose. But Dr. Yanni, would you say that how much of your, how many referrals do you get for fiber scans for autoimmune hepatitis? Not many, right? No, not very many. Uh, they're mainly, mainly for hepatitis, uh, viral hepatitis, and uh, for fatty liver. Um, and that's and you know, most right. Uh, uh, the the I think and the utility for a fibro scan in in acute hepatitis when there is active inflammation. Um, and my humble opinion would be limited because, you know, there's a lot of inflammation of the liver and we got to remind ourselves that the fibro scan looks at the stiffness of the liver using ultrasound waves. So there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of blood trying to repair the liver, a lot of blood inflaming the liver. Uh, you, you could have a positive fibrosis score on fibro scan, um, or a false positive, uh, and I, I, uh, I think I completely agree with everyone in, in terms of maybe looking after to see if fibrosis has developed or if fibrosis is improving, uh, but not in the acute setting. Right. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. So um, this lady gave, we gave her prednisone 20 and azathioprine 50 milligrams a day. You know, um, I'm just going to say this now, you know, if she were jaundiced, I probably would have just given her prednisone only, um, but because she wasn't you know, terribly jaundice. I felt comfortable starting azathioprine uh, simultaneously. And she tolerated the, re the regimen pretty well, except she had terrible insomnia from the prednisone. So three months later, okay, her ALT is 65. So significant improvement, but clearly not normal. We want to be very strict about normal 20 to 30. Some people even say 15 to 25. The IgG is uh, improved, which is consistent with the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. And I love to check IgG because it tells you if it's the autoimmune hepatitis or something else that's causing the liver test to go up. You got her down to PRED5. That was a pretty fast taper, truth be told. And the azathioprine thought 50. However, she's gained over 25 pounds on prednisone. And she asked you, doctor, what is the next step in management? So... We started her on uh, mycophenolate mofetil, one gram BID. The azathioprine was stopped and eventually the prednisone was tapered off. And one year later, she was stable on MMF monotherapy with a normal ALT and a normal IgG. And just like Dr. Um, Saab and Han predicted, we did a fibro scan two years after biochemical remission with stage one fibrosis or 4.5 kilopascals. Okay, so let's get to the questions that, that everyone's waiting to answer. So. Really briefly, the first side, you know, this is about difficult cases for autoimmune, but the first question is really when to treat, right? So treatment indications, persistent ALT elevation, of course, bridging necrosis, interface hepatitis on liver biopsy, and symptoms, fatigue, arthralgias, jaundice. It's less clear to treat if they're asymptomatic, if they have near normal ALT, because then you're gonna say, how do you know if you're doing well or not if you're successfully treating? And burnt out cirrhosis. So as a transplant center, you often see patients who come to you with cirrhosis from autoimmune. And the fellows always ask me, well, would you start azathioprine now? And I think that's a very controversial topic. If there are liver cells to save, I would. If not, then you know the ship has sailed, the horse has left the barn, what are you trying to prevent? Because they've already reached the dreaded outcome that you're trying to prevent. And remission, remember, is defined as normal ALT and IgG biochemically 
or histologic evidence of remission, which is actually the more accurate way to think about it. <clears throat> so it's difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. So it's a very heterogeneous presentation. We have patients who come into UCLA with acute liver failure, you know, elevated INR, hepatic encephalopathy, the whole kit and caboodle. And then you have relatively asymptomatic patients who are just picked up on their annual routine hepatic panel surveillance. This picture here does show that there's a significant increase in diagnosis among older adults. So, you know, autoimmune hepatitis is classically known as a disease that affects young people and older people. And we used to think 55, 6, 55 60, but now we're seeing it um, even in older generation, um, older people, and of course, women greater than men, as in the case of this study. Uh, 10 to 20% do not respond to first line treatment, and there have been no new drug classes developed in decades. So even with remission, over 70% relapse at two years, despite biochemical remission for over 12 months. And the first line therapy is prednisone and azathioprine. But as we saw, the standard regimen is associated with significant metabolic toxicity, the weight gain, anxiety, and low quality of life. This is a slide that is a very familiar to us. This is what you see in all the guidelines, both for easel and ASLD. And we see that the baseline here is prednisone, and we've been using prednisone since the 1970s. But I think that this table is somewhat misleading in that it doesn't reflect real world issues. I think especially in the management of immunosuppression, the art is more of an art than it is of a science and practice varies widely. If you look at the European guidelines, they recommend higher doses of prednisone. That's where the 60 milligrams comes from. They recommend slower tapers. Um, most people on prednisone for 12 to 24 months, but most people do combination therapy. And you can see here that uh, in terms of the relative contraindications, the, the side effects of prednisone, and of course the side effects of azathioprine, you can see cytopenia is not just in the beginning, but after a year or six months on treatment. So it's really important, we keep harping on this because treatment is important because you have a very, very poor prognosis of biochemical remission cannot be achieved after 12 months. We see here in this chart from this paper in 2011 where the survival is significantly lower if you do not achieve normal ALT within 12 months. So finally getting to the question of what are alternative agents that we could use, MMF has already been mentioned you can also consider tacrolimus and budesonide. And we're gonna spend the next few slides just talking about these other treatments. So in terms of mycophenolate, so you know, I was taught that mycophenolate is a great regimen for people who don't respond to azathioprine, not due to side effects and not to treatment and not because of um, uh, liver tests, but because they can't tolerate pancreatitis, abdominal pain, et cetera. So this is a study, this was published by Zaku in 2016 in um, elementary pharmacology. And it was this prospective study. It was not a randomized control trial. And there were about 109 patients that were included in the MMF and prednisolone group. That's the bottom of this chart here. And 22 patients who received prednisone and azathioprine. It's important to know that at diagnosis, 32% of the patients had cirrhosis and 73% had an insidious presentation. And what we see here is that 94% responded initially to MMF within two months. 72% had complete response on this treatment and 78% maintained remission off prednisolone. And when we say um, remission or response, we're talking about normal AST, ALT, and IgG. So this basically shows that MMF does work as initial treatment for autoimmune hepatitis. This is a slide, you know, we always hear about um, MMF and tacrolimus, but this is the data for tacrolimus. So what they did here was this was actually a, a multi uh, international cohort that include both European, US and Canadian and Chinese centers. And it was a retrospective study. They looked at 171 patients who received MMF and 104 patients, 14 patients that received FK. And the MMF dose ranged from 500 milligrams per day to 200 grams per day. And FK was one to eight milligrams per day. And the graph here shows therapy response rates for people who are treated with MMF and tacrolimus. And we see here that tacrolimus may be superior to MMF as an alternative treatment in patients who are not responding to azathioprine and prednisone, which is the standard of care. I think two important points we have to mention about using MMF and tacrolimus is that 
Um, these second line treatments are actually much more expensive than azathioprine and prednisone. Azathioprine and prednisone are really dirt cheap. And to get approval for MMF and FK in autoimmune patients who are not transplanted is actually very challenging. And also, I want to say that MMF, especially in young women, so if you have a postmenopausal woman, you can go crazy with the MMF. But for young women, it's very teratogenic. So if they want to have kids in the future, it's probably not your best first line choice of immunosuppression. But I think at the here, it's really important to see that 56% receive normal, achieve normal AST, ALT, IgG, as opposed to 34% who got um, with MMF. Okay, so then the last one is budesonide. And even though, um, again, budesonide also not, taught, not uh, FDA approved for autoimmune hepatitis per se, but I think this study is important because it's the first randomized control trial study that we've had for autoimmune hepatitis um, since the 1970s. And I think what's really important is people kind of don't love this study, but I think one good thing to remember is that their definition or their inclusion criteria were very, very strict you know, the original autoimmune hepatitis studies that we had from the 70s, we didn't even, we hadn't even discovered hepatitis C yet. So you kind of have to ask yourself when you look at those old papers, how many of them actually had autoimmune hepatitis were giving prednisone to these patients. But these were people who did have autoimmune hepatitis and their outcomes were very strict in terms of their primary uh, uh, goal. So this was budesonide nine milligrams plus azathioprine versus prednisone plus azathioprine. And the primary endpoint was normal ALT without steroid side effects at six months. So here we see for the budesonide group that um, normal ALT without steroid side effects, 47% versus 18%. Um, can bi complete biochemical response at six months, 60% versus 39%. And clearly the prednisone group had more side effects than the budesonide group. I think what's interesting about this study is that at 12 months, uh, the the steroid group did catch up to the budesonide group. I know it's not statistically significant, but I think what this is trying to show is that budesonide is trying to go, it does it faster and with less side effects. So in terms of budesonide limitations, there are, uh, it's generic, but there are cost considerations. It's not improved in the US, only in 23 European countries and 13 non-European countries. Remember, you cannot use budesonide in cirrhosis. Um, if you remember the MMF and FK studies that I mentioned, they did use uh, like 30% of the patients did have cirrhosis and the long-term benefits are still, we have to think about those. So in terms of just treatment study, uh, the goal should be normal uh, summary, nor normalization of liver tests. So an AST of ALT of you know 50 and 60 is quote, not good enough. And I think those are the hardest patients to manage. I mean, if you're over hundred, clearly you need to do better. Um, when you get to 50 and 60, you ask yourself, is this good enough? But really, you should really be aiming for, you know, 20 to 30. And we struggle with this, not only in autoimmune hepatitis, but also in our chronic hepatitis B patients, our fatty liver patients. Um, standard treatment or standard of care in terms of most studied, most used, longest information is prednisone and azathioprine. Um, again, being mindful of the side effects that we see with prednisone and adjusting the azathioprine dose. And if you do so, do check TPMT. You wanna taper as clinically indicated. So all the charts make it seem like it's lockstep, right? Prednisone 40, 30, 20, 15, 10, but it's not. You cannot make a move until you look at the labs because the labs go up, you shouldn't be dropping the prednisone unless you think it's not autoimmune hepatitis, which gets really murky sometimes. You wanna uh, follow the AST, ALT, IgG, and CBC closely because of the leukopenia that we discussed with azathioprine. And of course, be aware of the side effects. And think of how many of your patients have autoimmune and fatty liver as well. The alternative therapies you wanna consider um, to azathioprine include MMF, um, which is really good for patients who can't tolerate azathioprine, but not in young women who wanna get pregnant. Tacrolimus, which actually may be more efficacious than MMF to people who failed azathioprine, and then budesonide as a steroid sparing agent. And that is it for me. Yeah, I think we have a few minutes. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of questions from the chat yeah, room? Sure. And this is something that, that's been burning in my mind is would you ever consider Celsip as first sign therapy instead of azathioprine? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, in that study, um, they, in the study that I showed earlier, they did consider Celsept as first line, not azathioprine. And so this study would actually support that you should consider that in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. It's just cost considerations. But again, this was a prospective study. 
Wow. It wasn't a randomized control study. So if you're really hard about the data and the quality of these studies, you know, you can't, it's hard, you know, FDA wants randomized controlled trials, right? Mm -hmm. um, but absolutely, you can consider CELCEPT as your first line therapy. And, and the other question in the chat is something that I think Jihan alluded to way in the beginning, and that is differential DILI. And so there's a question right. in the audience that, that they had a young woman in the 20s with autoimmune hepatitis. It looks like precipitated by monocycling, uh, mm -hmm. which is not uncommon. Um, and, and, and I'll print this for many years, but Gina, her IgG is still a little um, a little elevated. Right. So well, what do you do if people have normal AOT and a persisting mild IgG? I'm not sure if you or, 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 or Jihan or Dr. Han have any comments about that. That's a tough situation. Right. So I love this question and I hate this question. <laughs> so hard, right? So in a perfect world, when, when we can put patients into boxes, right, there's drug-induced liver injury, take the drug away, liver test improves spontaneously. There's autoimmune hepatitis or drug-induced autoimmune hepatitis, where you give the drug, right, you get a clinical presentation that's just like autoimmune hepatitis, you know, IgG, ANA, SMA, all positive, right? In that scenario, you treat like autoimmune hepatitis, prednisone, azathioprine. But those people, you should be able to withdraw azathioprine and prednisone, and they never have any other problems, right? So they're not on long-term therapy. Then there's the third box where the drug triggers their immune system. And we know that this is, you know, why does autoimmune hepatitis happen? It's, you know, genetic trigger, environmental trigger, anxiety, stress, all these things, HLA, right? They turn on your immune system. And once your immune system is turned off, even though the minocycline is taken away, the immune system never turns off. So in that case, you could justify keeping the patient on azathioprine lifelong. So it's very hard a priori, and it's very difficult to predict who your patient will be. So you just have to follow them. And when in doubt, biopsy to help guide you your know, we, You know, you start these patients with autoimmune hepatitis on treatment. It's perfectly reasonable after three years of stable blood tests and everything to try stopping medication to see what happens. So, I mean... Um, um, you can do that. One, one other comment about using CELCEPT as first-line therapy, you have to be a little bit careful. It's, it's more expensive, but remember, CELCEPT is contraindicated in pregnancy. And if you have a young woman of childbearing age, um, CELCEPT may not be the drug you want to start on. <laughs> yeah. Especially if they're telling you they, they want to have a family. Right, because that transition, let's say you take it off and you put the azathioprine back on, you can risk a flare during that transition, right? <laughs> but this here shows, you know, even after a remission, over 70% relapse at two years, despite biochemical remission for over 12 or one, two or three months. So unless the patient is begging me to stop therapy, I rarely stop therapy in true autoimmune hepatitis. Yeah. Do you like to biopsy before deciding to stop? Yeah, you should, because just like the histologic could be delayed from the biochemical. Did and if they have fibrosis, like stage three fibrosis, I would never stop. I would not stop. Yeah. yeah. But if they had one or two or one, okay, I'll try this experiment with you. Put your seatbelt, bite your nails. Gina, there's a really good question that, that unfortunately resonates with our practices. And the question is, you know, if you have a patient with mildly elevated AOT, ultrasonal fatty liver, um, you know, what, what do you think about mild ANA, positive ultra fatty liver and ultrasound? What do you do in the situation? Do you biopsy everybody? No, 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 no. So uh, I see so many patients with fatty liver who have a positive SMA to 1 to 20. So even by the death and and ANA positive is healthy, healthy positive among the population. So you really kind of have to look at their clinical history. What you can do in those situations is you say, okay, you need to lose weight. And if your AST and ALT improve, then the proof is in the pudding, right? This is fatty liver. If they've lost a ton of weight and the liver tests are still up, then you might start thinking about a second diagnosis. But autoimmune markers, you know, technically SMA 1 to 20 does not meet the criteria for autoimmune hepatitis. Right. So I see it all the time. You guys do too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 